Hey, everybody. My name is Mariano. That sexy guy over there is Brent. He told me to call him that. <laughs> you are listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast. So today we are going to be going over structure. It's something that people tend to have a hard time with either because they're not quite sure what it means or what it looks like in practice, or maybe they feel bad implementing structure altogether. So we'll be getting into what it is, how you can benefit from it, what you should be doing. Stick around. Welcome to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers for dog trainers or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. Please join us in episode four as we discuss the importance of structure, what it is, and how to implement it in your home with your dog. Welcome back, everybody. This is Brent Labrada with the Dog Trainers Podcast. We want to welcome you guys back to our third episode, which is revolving all around the ideas and concept of structure with our dogs. Uh, now, as a dog trainer and a dog owner, um, you know, the idea of structure is, is was pretty vague when I first started, right? We knew that it had something to do with schedules and routines and certain practices that needed to be put into place. Um, but what I realized throughout the years is, um, you know, it's really hard to describe something that you yourself weren't good at, right? And it's really hard for you to give advice on something uh, that you yourself weren't good at. Now, a couple of things I learned uh, being a, a young dog trainer, working with other experienced dog trainers, is there were things that we would do naturally in our regiments and our day-to-day -day practices that would actually provide structure, and I was completely unaware of it. And because I was unaware of it, I developed kind of this, um, this, this hidden knowledge of what to do, but I had no idea exactly how to explain it, how to break it down, and how to interpret it in a way that a client could understand it with their new puppy or a rescue um, or anything like that, right? Um, and so today, what our hopes are for any, uh, you know, new dog trainers listening, old dog trainers that are having a hard time explaining this, or just people who are suffering with maybe uh, not being able to implement proper structure, we want to really break down to you guys what it means um, from our perspective. And we hope that today's episode is really useful for you. All right. Uh, so Mariano, what, when, when you're dealing with clients, what kind of things uh, do you run into in regards to, to structure? I run into a few different things. So you find the client who hears you and they want to be on board with what you're saying, but they don't quite know what structure is. And so they'll, they'll either work on stuff and only kind of take it for face value. So it'll be like, yeah, I create my dog, I heal my dog, I do obedience throughout the day, and I exercise him, but he, you know, he's been good. And a lot of times, they'll kind of slack a little. And then the dog will start reverting backwards. And they're like, I don't know what happened. And we have to find out by asking questions that I mean, I guess I haven't been creating him when I wasn't home. So he has had right. time to bark at people. Or, and then there's the other type of owner who just feels bad. And they, they kind of assume that structure is limiting. It's like prison. It's, you know, it's, it's not something that they really feel like they want to do or that they should have to do. Right, right. And I guess what would you say is like the number one cause that people fall off of the structure or, you know, maybe don't, uh, don't pro continue to provide structure? I think what causes people to fall off is just they don't understand the value of structure and of continued structure. And they, they get it in very simple terms. Like, yeah, I, I understand, you know, they, they, even sometimes they'll kind of look at you like, you know, like annoyed because they think you think they're dumb or say, yeah, I get it. Sit down. I, I know all the stuff, but mm -hmm. it's really, the magic is in helping them understand that over time, it's a transformative thing. If you're teaching a dog how to sit, how to lay down, how to be patient, how to be focused, the dog learns other things along the way. And, and a, a quick example that I like to give is uh, my little brother. So my little brother, when I was, when I was still living at home, he was 17 and I would go to the gym really early in the day, just because I'd like to start my day with the gym. And mm -hmm. so he came to me one day and was like, it was really early, like before school, even like four or five ish. So he mm -hmm. came to me one day and was like, hey, can I start going with you? And I said, sure. And so <laughs> I get up in the morning. I go to his room. He's already awake, ready to go. He's excited. First day with big brother in the gym. We go and we work out. <laughs> nice. <laughs> he's you know, motivated, super motivated. Yeah. But, you know, a couple days in, he's, you know, I go wake him up like the third day and he's still asleep. Yeah. And I'm like, come on, man, get up. He gets up. We go fourth day. Come on, man, get up. He doesn't want to go. And I, <laughs> right. I made him go. And the thing is, you know, I don't care how strong he is, what he looks like. 
but he said he wanted to go. I don't care how strong his bench press is, but the thing is, it's not workouts that I am interested in. It's teaching him the importance of being punctual, of sticking to your word, of making sure that you set aside, you know, things like, I think I'm tired or whatever the case to get the job done. There right. are lessons that you learn kind of by proxy when you're teaching obedience. A dog knows how to sit. You can teach a dog how to sit in like a few lessons. Right. But to really get them to understand it is, will the dog hold the sit even when there's like another dog walking by or even when the mailman comes to the door? It's right. sit and patience and then it's sit and focus and then it's these other things. And people don't quite understand how structure can slowly kind of encompass a dog's well-being and, and just take it to another place. Right. Totally. And so, so kind of what I'm picking up from you, you're saying that, uh, certain, certain regiments and, and certain activities and certain practices in regards to structure, they have kind of indirect benefits and indirect effects on the overall psychology and behavior of a dog as, as I, as they do with people, right. As they totally do with people. Um, and one thing that I, that I kind of relate to is, uh, you know, we call it adulting. Right. I remember being I <laughs> adulting and I remember being uh, just just a younger kid, you know, in my early 20s. And, you know, we kind of lived our life doing as we wanted, stay up late. You know, I remember going to bed at two in the morning and then having work at 630 in the morning. Right. So, you know, back then we could do stuff like that. But over time, what happens is you start seeing how the lack of structure in your own personal life can actually affect your mental states, your mood, how you can be fatigued more easily. You don't perform well at work. Um, and so there's kind of like uh, all, just simply by going to bed on time making certain sacrifices for, you know, certain things that I wanted to do, even though I wanted to do them, I didn't necessarily, I had to tell myself, you can't do that right now because your job, your reputation, your, you know, what, whatever it is that I found to be more important had to actually prevail in those right. circumstances. And right? I think a, a quick note that, you know, before you continue is just when you say making sacrifices, we're always sacrificing something, you know, there's always a decision, right. but the key is with structure in any sort of context, dogs, people, you have to sacrifice the thing that needs to go away anyway. Right. Right. So like choosing not to eat that cheesecake, it's still a choice. You're still sacrificing the, I guess, the short term pleasure of it, but right. I'm still working on that one, by the way. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all about, it's all about choosing the thing that benefits you, that truly benefits you. So it's True. not really a sacrifice. True. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And so, you know, th this is a dog training podcast and, and people might be wondering, why the hell are you talking about a human experience? Like we all know adulting, we all know regiments, we all know schedules. Um, and and uh, what we're really trying to get to is we want everybody to relate to this uh, experience because if it works for us, then you guys totally will get by the end of this podcast why it works for dogs. Right. Right. Um, so uh, keep listening and take some notes if you guys want, because uh, let's get, let's go ahead and start diving into it. Okay? okay. I've asked a couple of my clients, you know, what is structure to you? And I hear a lot of common words being used, buzzwords, if you will. Um, and I, it's really important for me right now to bring these buzzwords to the forefront, because sometimes as a teacher, we might use certain words that socially are interpreted differently by the learner or the audience, right? And so I want to bring some of these words up. Um, and if we can just kind of maybe riff on uh, what common interpretations are. Now, this data that we've collected, I've literally interviewed my clients, many of my clients before this podcast. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully I'm not, just, I'm not just making any of this stuff up. So um, here we go. All right. One buzzword that I want to talk about in regard that I hear a lot when we talk about structure is people will say the word discipline, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what I've learned is that a lot of times when the word discipline is used um, in regards to dog training or dog ownership, already socially there's kind of this uh, interpretation that discipline means to reprimand or to punish, Right. Because we've heard phrases like, you know, you need to discipline that dog or you need to discipline that kid or you need to discipline that employee. And usually that means get them in trouble. Right. right. Um, and so uh, what, what thoughts do you have on that? No, I agree. So I think that people people have this habit of they associate structure with discipline, which is. Well, they associate discipline with punishment, which is right. wrong, but to associate right. structure with discipline is right. And I think that where people got the idea is. When you say, you know, oh, that dog needs discipline and they mean, you know, a correction or they mean punishment or whatever the case. Right, right. 
the idea behind it is if you correct the dog, while discipline and punishment aren't directly the same thing, correcting, you know, well-timed, like appropriate corrections can lead to a more disciplined dog. So they, right. they kind of say it in this, this way. That's not exactly accurate, but that's what they're kind of getting at. Right. Okay. I get that. Um, and I think, you know, we hear phrases a lot like, um, uh, like, like we know that the word discipline doesn't mean to hit anyone or hurt anyone, right? Because for example, martial arts is a discipline. Yoga is a discipline. Meditation is a discipline. These things that are very, you know, other than the martial arts, it's, it's non-combative stuff, right? And so uh, discipline it can be misinterpreted to mean reprimand and punishment. But when we talk about it as dog trainers, really what we're talking about is we're talking about uh, regiments, right? We're creating a predictable schedule of events or behavior. In essence, when we talk about discipline, we're literally talking about one of the most important words in dog training is the word consistency, Right, right. We want our clients to be disciplined, aka consistent. Right, and honestly, the as part of a human living the human experience, um, uh, being consistent is very difficult. Right, is very difficult for the average person. Um, and so, this is where sometimes I feel, um, you know, a lot of people fall off. Right, they might do something strong for a week, um, and then fall off on day eight, day ten, um, and then little by little they plateau and it kind of just fades out. Right. right. So, so when we say discipline, we mean uh, creating uh, consistency in the dog. So that way the dog can predict things, uh, either predict a schedule, predict events, or predict a behavior uh, that you're going to have or that the environment's going to, going to implement. Yeah. Right? And I wanted to be clear about one quick thing when it comes to discipline and it comes to, you know, corrections, let's say like the appropriate name for what people mean when they say the word discipline, mm -hmm. the idea an appropriate correction, good timing, you know, good, good fervor, you know, whatever the word for like nothing over the top or nothing too subtle, just mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. It can create discipline because if a dog knows what's going on, you correct for a certain behavior because they, they completely understood what you expected and then willfully chose to do something else. Right. What ends up happening over time, just like anything else, it's a function of repetition the dog starts to build their own sense of structure. How do I avoid this correction and instead seek out reward? Yeah. That and whether it's a, a whether it's a correction or just opposition, right? Like my owner will always say, get off the counter or my owner will always, you know, make me sit at the front door as a habit, right? So right. Dis discipline is one of those words that, uh, you know, if we, if dog trainers use it, you know, they don't mean to, punish or reprimand your dog. Okay. Um, now here we go. Another one that I hear a lot is, uh, the word rules. So they'll say, you know, you got to give your dog rules because, you know, we're taught, uh, at a very, you know, surface level that like humans love rules and kids love rules and it actually makes them thrive. Right. And we understand this, uh, intellectually because we're like, true, true. But then more, as I think about it, I realized like as a kid, like I hated rules hated rules. So I'm thinking like, in my mind, I'm like, what is it that people really interpret rules to be? And interviewing my clients, some of them say things like, oh, well, rules are things that are unacceptable behaviors, right? So your dog will not jump, you know, your dog shall not uh, sleep in bed, your dog shall not, you know, uh, eat your food, eat human food, your dog shall not beg, right? And so these ideas of rules um, what I'm, what I'm picking up from a lot of my clients is that rules tend to be, um, only focused on what the dog shouldn't be doing. What's an unacceptable behavior that the dog is, is, is focused on. Right. And, uh, dog trainers, we see this all the time where, you know, so many times I have to tell a client, like praise your dog for what he did. Right. Praise your dog for what he's doing. Right. Also praise your dog for the absence of bad behavior which is also important. And a lot of times our brains just get focused on what the dog shouldn't be doing versus on what the dog is doing or, or guiding the dog to do something that is more acceptable. Right. right? Uh, anything you want to riff on with that? No, I think you covered that beautifully. Cool. Now when dog trainers talk about rules, there's going to be two uh, paradigms, right? Yes. Rules are going to be things that are unacceptable behavior. So we need to make sure we're constantly putting a block or opposition in areas that we know the dog can't indulge in eating a sock or the dog can't kill the cat, right? We have to have rules, right? 
But also another part of rules are something I like to call preventative principles. Okay, so preventative principles, I'll explain it to you like this. A lot of my clients, they come to me and they go, Brent, okay, training's great, awesome, but just want to know what command do I use uh, when the dog is in a fight with another dog, <laughs> right? Like the dog's already over the edge. Right, or, right. or one that's more common is like, what command do I use to tell my dog to not steal food off the counter? right? That's something super specific. And they want a very crystal clear command like off. And they want to, you know, they want that to be an automatic response. And the problem is, is that if your dog finds the opportunity to jump on your counter when no one's looking, because there's a juicy steak on there, a young puppy, an untrained dog is, is going to go for it, right? If, if they have a really high food drive, right? Um, and so a preventative principle is a rule that's put in place to prevent the dog from failing, right? So what I'll tell people is I'll tell them, you know, unfortunately, there isn't a command for that. However, if you teach your dog to not be in the kitchen when food is out, you will never run into that circumstance, right? Some people will also ask questions like, how do I get my dog to start bolting out the front door? Well, there are certain preventative principles that we need to put into place as very firm rules that the family also needs to be disciplined in. Uh, so that way the dog knows what to do before the ability to make the wrong decision was ever presented to them. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's basically, you know, I, a big one for people is my dog jumps on guests when they come to the house and then, you know, place command is a great one. Put your dog yeah. in place. That's a preventative principle. He can't jump without first breaking place. A hundred percent. 100%. Um, what's another one? What's another word that, that we hear a lot, Mariano? In terms of structure? Obedience. Yeah. Obedience is a oh, good one. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Want to riff be, on that a little bit? Sure. Well, I think, you know, I, it kind of ties back to what we started with that people, people know what obedience is. I think that the average owner in you know, today's world with iPhones and internet and all that stuff that they know what training looks like, but they they don't quite understand it for more than face value. It's like, okay, well, my dog knows how to sit now. He knows how to lay down now. He knows how to do these things. When the real magic of obedience, again, is in the in the continued work. It's building repetition. It's building habits. Habit forming is a huge aspect of structure. Right, right. And a lot of, a lot of things that I see in obedience, as you mentioned, like people kind of look at the surface value of obedience, right? I'll get phone calls all the time where people will be like, hi, I'm just calling about dog training. Um, and they preface the whole conversation where they say, you know, my dog is really sweet. He's really great. Right. We've had him for three years and he's really amazing and super affectionate and he's really obedient. And he, you know, he rolls over, he gives paw, he like shakes and he's like a really good listener. Uh, and then, so then I'll ask them and I'll say, so what's the problem? And they'll go, well, he bites people, right? <laughs> my dog, my dog is aggressive or my dog right. lunges at other dogs, right? right? He can't stop murdering children. But other than that, <laughs> yeah. he can't stop murdering or, or chasing skateboarders, right? Um, and so what we kind of see is we kind of see, again, this confusion or like this misinterpretation of what obedience is. So uh, let's go ahead and break down for the audience when a dog trainer says obedience versus when a dog owner thinks their dog is obedient what we're really talking about. Yeah. Okay. So what I like to break it down in is I like to break it down into three phases, right? Obedience is, has stages to it. Okay. Um, we call one the, the shaping. So like we shape a behavior that we want or we develop it, that we develop the skill. That's stage number one. Stage number two is where we condition that skill to be called upon it at any time. Right. So all of a sudden my dog's running around and while he's in the middle of a distraction, I say, come. And the dog has to learn to do that immediately when there's distraction. Or if I tell the dog to all of a sudden lay down and stay, I want to make sure that I can call upon that at any time and demand that. And the only way we get there is through repetition, 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 right. and reminder and guidance, reminder and guidance and reward, right? Reminder, guidance, and reward. Um, and then the third stage is actually where the dog can do it as a job, right? Where the dog does the behavior either automatically or is almost anticipating what you're going to ask at any given time. And to us, this is what obedience training is. We're trying to teach our dog a skill 
We're trying to develop that skill to be so strong that it works around distractions. And then we also want to develop that even further where the dog now takes that skill that we developed and we, he takes it as a responsibility in the context that we've trained him to do it. Right. right? Um, and this is how people who are able to do like competitions, right. And they're able to do competition work uh, with, you know, 2000 people in the audience. This is how police dogs are able to, you know, hone in on the target, even though there's gunfire and helicopters and all these things going on because the dog has been practiced and regimented and disciplined in these environments to be able to perform that behavior. Right. Right. And what I'm what I'm seeing a lot is people are just taking obedience commands for face value. In essence, they're just kind of taking them as a trick. My dog can do a trick, but my dog doesn't listen to me. Can I give a quick I don't want to get too off base here, Mm -hmm. but uh, my my jujitsu instructor, he does a podcast uh, and it's it mostly has to do with jujitsu. And one of my favorite episodes of his was his very last one. And it was to compete or not to compete. Mm -hmm. And I'm not suggesting necessarily that you compete with obedience with your dog, but the message was this, it's the phases are all the same. There's shaping in, you know, when you're learning a new skill or learning a new guard or a new type of thing, there is a really slow, really, you know, intricate shaping moment where the own, where the instructor rather, they sit with you and they make sure that, you know, every little hand placement and you do everything. And it's super slow. This is not live action, right? Then there's the. You know, then there's like the, the expectation there's the, there's drilling now that we know now we're going to roll actively and I'm trying to do it while this guy's trying to avoid it. And we're, we're going right. at it. But an interesting thing is active rolling, even though it's full on rounds, it's very different than competition. Right. And the thing about competition is while you don't have to do it to get benefit from jujitsu, if you want to get the absolute utmost benefit, meaning more than just what you learn on the mats, jujitsu does crazy things for you all throughout your life. Right. Competing is a good way to go because you learn things about yourself. You learn how hard to push. You learn when to kind of relax. You learn how to ease up on the anxiety or, you know, the kind of pregame angst because you see the other guy over there and he's like ready to go. And, you know, there's all these fun little things that you learn when you're under pressure. And that's kind of what the third phase of obedience is. Now that the dog is shaped and he's ready to go and we we can really expect things out of him reliably, mm-hmm. then you start upping pressure to make sure that the dog knows how to cope because that's almost... A completely separate skill set than just knowing how to sit in and of itself. Right, I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. And uh, I mean, you you just described a really awesome pattern of how you know you you go from being a novice, you develop a skill, you drill that skill, you practice it, and then you go ahead and actually learn to do it in real time. Right. And as dog trainers, that's constantly what we are trying to teach our clients, and it's a lot of work. Right. Yeah. And dog training is not easy. Teaching a dog to roll over is easy. Teaching a dog to roll over and on a stage in front of 300 people on right, right. America's Got Talent, that takes repetition. That takes, right. that takes skill. That takes it's almost practice. not even the same thing. Not even, right? I was watching John Wick Part 3, and you guys all know, you know, if you guys watch John Wick Part 3, you totally know that Belgian Malinois scene. Those dogs were years and years of training. Yeah. You know, so anyways, I don't want to get off topic because I love that movie, but um, Halle Berry had to go through all kinds of training just to handle the dogs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and just to be able to speak that language and to talk fluently Mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. Right. It's really cool. Um, Shout out to John Wick, Keanu Reeves. Anyways, um, so let's let's talk about uh, one of the last words I have here Um, again in regards to structure. Some of the words I hear uh, said a lot in regards to the value of structure is the word limits. Right. Yeah. How do you think that people interpret this word limits when reg- in regards to their dog? They think of everything that they can't do. Uh, a lot of times limits are it's one of the words that people preempt. So if you start talking about limits, they cut you off and they're like, I know I probably shouldn't, but I, I actually let him <laughs> sleep with me and I really True. like to. But and they're like already they're already putting themselves in the position to like, let that go and kind of mourn it in real time. Right. right and I'm like, no, right, I'm not right. saying that you can't do these things. I mean, my dogs sleep with me sometimes or, you know, right. it, on the couch sometimes, yeah. like human food sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Limits can, you know, you can still have access to your dog. I mean, that's, you know, you want to love on your dog, of course, but right. That's oftentimes what they jump to when limits, they are limiting what a dog should do, but often it's more beneficial than that. It's more Limiting a choice isn't always a bad thing. If I limit my dog's ability to like chase a squirrel across the street, potentially get hit by a car, right? that's me being a good owner, but it's a yeah. limit. 
You know, yeah, so- it, it is a limit. It totally is a limit. Um, and so a, a lot of, and, and again, I can't hold it completely against owners because I've also had clients that tell me, you know, I just called a dog trainer um, and the dog trainer said that I can't pet my dog. I'm, right. I can't feed my dog. Uh, normally I'm not allowed to, you know, look at my dog when I walk into the house and, you know, they, they pretty much are told like, Hey, treat your dog. Like he is nothing. Right. right? And so I can totally understand how maybe a perspective is skewed, especially if an owner's had this experience with a dog trainer, uh, before. And, you know, that's their philosophy. And I totally understand that philosophy. It's kind of a very dominant based, uh, break them down to build them back up type of philosophy. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the reality of it is, is, is a human, a loving dog, loving human is always going to feel really uncomfortable with that. Right. right. In some way, shape or form. So uh, uh, it's very easy for them to look at this as what we're depriving our dogs. Of. We're depriving our dogs of love. We're depriving our dogs of food, attention, affection, space, all of these things. And so this is why we see a lot of people already kind of put their guard up when we start saying you got to put limits on this or that or this or that. Uh, because also sometimes uh, people, uh, people live vicariously through their dogs, right? People think that freedom is fun and what everyone would want. Um, and you know, dogs, uh, no one, no one loves anything more than seeing their dog run free. And I totally get that. But right. even that needs to have a limit because if you have a dog that runs around all over the goddamn place, I guarantee you won't be able to stop them. Yeah. Well, right? freedom is fun. You know, they're not wrong. It's just freedom is only fun when everybody plays by a certain set of rules. So freedom is actually a very delicate thing mm-hmm. in the dog world and you know, the human world, I guess too. But in the dog world, I mean, it's great to have dogs at a dog park and they're free, but mm-hmm. there are rules. You yeah. know, there's no fighting. There is no this. There is no humping. There is no that. And so, yep, yep. you know, there are still rules to adhere to. And that's the way to make everybody, you know, equally free. It, it's a hard, it's like its own complicated little subtopic. But I don't knock people for assuming the limit. The reason why I bring that up the way that I did is because when we're, when we consider, you know, younger dog trainers or, you know, people who may be listening to this who could kind of benefit from that assumption, because I'm sure people listening will kind of jump to that assumption too. It's good to know where clients tend to go with it so that you can start to develop your workaround of like, no, 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 it's not this. Like, listen, I totally understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. However, I want to assure you, I sleep with my dogs too. I do these things too. As long as you can keep structure in place everywhere else, you can have, you know, the dog can still have freedom, but there are still rules, but the rules don't necessarily have to be on the bed. Right, right. It doesn't have to be the, 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 the expectation from the dog. Right now. Yeah. I always tell people, I said, my dog's on the couch. My dog sleeps on bed. But the only difference is if I tell my dog to get off and go to his crate, he'll exactly. do it on command. Exactly. You know, that's, that's the only difference. Right. So let's, let's go into a little bit of what dog trainers really mean when we talk about limits, um, because uh, this might help open your eyes up to please understand that it's not depriving your dog of something, but what it is, is we're shaping the dog's character. Um, and how we do that. So the definition that I fa- have for limits is how far we allow our dogs to go physically, mentally, and emotionally um, in as, as a dog, right? right. And so our, our job is to really guide them. Um, and we look at, at you know, children, right? Um, you know, an example of physical uh, boundary that we would use with children that we also use with dogs is uh, parameters, like where they can be at any given time, right? Right, right? I need you to be home at this time. I need you to, you can't leave your room because you're grounded, whatever it is. If we can't set limits on the dog, um, then it's going to be hard. So a couple common dog limits, uh, physical dog limits that we have to set is sometimes where they can be in the house, um, how far they can p- go on the leash. Can they, are they allowed to pull on the leash? Are they allowed to jump and invade personal space? Um, what else? Um, if you think of any, please just jump in. Well, you, you gave a perfect one earlier. If there's food out, dogs are not allowed in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a c- kind of controlling that whole space. Right. So these physical things that we, that we, the limits that we put on dogs actually uh, directly and indirectly affect their mental and emotional states. Right. Right. Um, and so uh, this is so funny because, you know, it's we've uh, we've all been uh, introduced to mental health. And me personally, I go to therapy um, and a lot of my friends go to therapy. And, you know, we've been introduced to 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 cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, CBT therapy. And I think one of the best breakdowns I was ever given of cognitive behavioral therapy was uh, understand when it was introduced to me, it was knowing that your physical behavior 
affects your mental and emotional behavior and how altogether the physical, the mental and emotional all work together like a triangle. And by being able to maybe adjust your focus, your mental state, um, it will affect your feelings and your physical behavior. By being able to adjust your physical behavior, it'll affect your mental and emotional states. Right. And so it's really cool when you kind of see this triangle and how it all works together, because when it was described to me and my friend was telling me the type of therapy she was going through and the assignment she had and the things she had to do, I was thinking in my head, I was like, that's freaking dog training. Right. <laughs> that's what we do with dogs all the time. You, you know, know it's funny. It's just it's just routine building. Yeah. Period. It's yeah. structure. It's, you know, I think it's just a lost art in today's world. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it's and it's. It's so interesting because there's so many parallels between the human experience and the dog experience. And yes, I understand we're two very separate species, but you guys got to remember, we brought domesticated dogs into the human world 33,000 years ago, and they have to learn to deal with us <laughs> right. and deal with the world that we've constructed with them. So we have these very, very high expectations for these dogs to be calm and balanced and relaxed and not aggressive and all these things. But even humans have trouble with that stuff, right? right. So I, I want to go back to, to you know, for those of you listening, and hopefully you guys can make that connection um, because this is ultimately what we're doing with dogs. So physical limits is, in essence, just phys changing the dog's physical behavior, right? Uh, how would you describe mental limits? Changing the dog's mental behavior. What are they focusing on? How aroused are you allowing them to be? Or, or how much are you arousing them if they're relaxing and you throw a ball? Right. You know, it's just a matter of learning how to have that, that reliable sort of handle to which you can manipulate a dog's mental state. Yep. And so in essence, it's like telling the dog or like giving, allowing the dog, telling the dog what they can focus on and what they, and how long they can focus on it for. Right. Because uh, especially we get the big calls for dogs who are obsessive over something, right? My dog keeps, mm, I don't know, hunting the cat or is crazy about squirrels or, you know, won't stop staring at me while I'm eating and he's drooling all over the place. So right. mentally, if we can change that dog's focus, that mental, that, that mental shift that we create, we change the dog's physical behavior and emotional state. Right. right? I think a lot of mental, a lot of mental adjusting has to do with priority reorganizing. So, right. you know, we've talked before about when you have a dog that either chases a cat or, you know, is, is sitting there salivating because of food. These are all things that nobody necessarily has to teach a dog in order for them to know that they want to be engaged in it. Right. And it's possible that a dog can chase a million cats in his lifetime and never catch one. And right. yet he'll never lose motivation. It doesn't matter that his hit rate is zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's like why it's like wiley coyote and the road runner. yeah and the road runner. does he ever no he never catches road but you know <laughs> only on family guy on family guy he caught him oh those, but that does that <laughs> those jerks. um but yeah you know so the thing is it's a self-reinforcing behavior the dog naturally loves it even on a chemical level the dog naturally literally loves it and mm -hmm. so when you start giving mental structure when you start dictating what the dog can focus on and through obedience through physical structure you can start having more mental control. Right. And what I mean by that is dogs love chasing cats naturally. Mm -hmm. Dogs don't love laying down naturally. They don't hate it. They don't dislike it, but they don't love it. But they can be taught to love it through obedience, through rewards, through really right. understanding that doing this gets you that. Right. And then once you have that, it's, you know what? Don't salivate here. Go over there and lay down. Both of these right. things are beneficial. And one of them I, I prefer. So that kind of puts it over the edge. Right. Right. I think one, one common mental limit that I see people really just in, or th that people don't indulge in creating is marking. Right. I, mm -hmm. I, I would say about 80%, maybe 75% of the clients that I teach leash training to their dogs are savage markers on the walk. Like yeah, literally yeah. they come out the front door, they pee on that bush, then they cut a 45 degree angle to the next bush and then the tree. And these dogs are constantly obsessed with marking. And one thing I have to explain to people is that your dog's obsession and his focus, his, his intent focus on just marking, marking, claiming territory, claiming territory is actually what creates that anxiety that makes him emotionally defensive, reactive, and feel challenged. 
Right. right. So that's an example right there of how if we don't guide the dog to focus on something different than what they what their instinct tells them to focus on, then it will definitely affect their physical and emotional uh, states. One hundred percent regularly. Right? I think a, a really easy way to put it to people is try to eliminate as many positive feedback loops as you can. And a positive feedback loop is something that will automatically reinforce itself and just go on forever and ever and ever. If the dog right. can mark, I don't care how many times, there will always be the next dog on the next walk. And so he'll never be done. And so yeah. it's just going to add fuel to the fire and it won't ever stop. Right. And let's give people just a separate example of what a positive, um, uh, what'd you say? Sorry, I lost terminology. A positive, positive, sorry. positive feedback, a positive loop. feedback loop. It's something positive that keeps feedback itself loop. going. Yes. So let's talk. I, I know what it is. I just forgot what you said. Uh, positive feedback loop. Okay. So for example, like the mailman, right? Why right. do dogs hate the mailman? Right. I'll tell you exactly why the dogs hate the mailman. A strange man comes to the front of your house every day. Now, it usually starts in adolescence. Your dog sees this strange man out of the window or coming to the front door where the mailbox is. He gets nervous and he barks for the first time. That dog barks and the mailman puts the mail in the slot and in the dog's eyes, the mailman runs away from him, right? So what happens is the dog goes, phew, that threat was, was I, I scared him away. He's never coming back again. And then guess what happens the next day? The mailman comes right back up to your mail, to your mailbox, drops the mail. Your dog goes, the guy's back again. He barks three times, four times. Then again, the next day, then he goes, this motherfucker keeps coming back to this freaking house. I got to keep my eye on this guy. I actually have to be on the lookout for him, right? And it's this loop that happens. The mailman comes, the dog barks, scares him away. This is a positive feedback loop. This is where bad behaviors can continue to turn into a cycle over and over and over and over and over, just like chasing the squirrel, just like marking. Uh, there's all these little things that happen because they are naturally um, reinforcing to the dog. Right. It becomes an obsession. And it becomes their obsession and their sole reason for living or their sole mission in that house is to get rid of any intruders that might be threatening the perimeter of your home. Right. 100%. And that's why a lot, that's why a lot of dogs bark out the front door. That's why a lot of dogs hate guests when they come over, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think we've spent a lot of time on the mental. Let's talk about emotional limits. Okay. Now emotional limits is an interesting thing because as, as, as humans, we can talk to each other, right? So I can ask my sister or my niece or my nephew, so how do you feel? Like, like what's on your mind? Right. And usually they can go ahead and express to me their thoughts and they can express to me how they're feeling. Um, and, you know, it, depending on how they're feeling, you know, I'm going to empathize, I'm going to listen to them. Uh, and, but then I'm able to give them emotional feedback. No, you shouldn't think that way. You have to believe in blah, blah, blah. You should, you know, we kind of guide that emotion so that way they don't keep falling into that rut. Right. And that's kind of um, uh, uh, something people do in therapy and counseling. Um, you know, in parenting, all that gets done, right? And it's easy for easier for us to do as humans because we speak the same language, right. and we can we can we can identify what's going on in the dog's body language or in the in the kid's body language and mental state. Um, but the problem is, is with dogs, the only way you can actually read their emotional state is by learning to master reading their body language. Right. Um, we tend to see like the, the reactions of dogs. So we, we know the dog is upset when he's lunging and growling, uh, but we don't necessarily see the, the preemptive things that happen before that. Right. And so the same way it's our job as uh, humans to give people emotional feedback, like uh, praising them for things that they do well. Uh, you know, uh, maybe showing disapproval or disappointment when they when they're behaving a certain way wrong. Um, you know, our job is to also provide limits on the way that dogs are allowed to feel about certain things and certain contexts of things, right? Um, and there are ways that we directly can affect emotion, but then there are ways that we indirectly affect emotion. And I've heard Mariano riff on this a lot. Um, would you be able to kind of elaborate a little bit on that, man? Yeah. So when we talk about affecting emotion, to me, it, it's harder to directly affect emotion. I, I know that you can, you can affect arousal levels and mm -hmm. you can affect, you know, kind of short-term things. But the problem with affecting emotion is I'm not 
I'm not sure that a dog is aware of their emotional state. They know when they're excited. They know how they, they, they know that they feel negative about a person, but they're, they're not like introspective enough to be like, you know, maybe I should let this go. Right. It's more indirect through the physical work and the mental work. No, don't focus on that guy. Don't bark at the mailman. Go over there, lay down and relax. Right. You can start, you can start introducing just peace back into that context. And that's kind of the way that, you know, when a dog is emotionally unsure or emotionally ungrounded, they just, they pour all this mental and physical energy into something that's just not necessary. They, they don't have a sense of perspective, which naturally they wouldn't. And it's, it's our job to go in and kind of teach that sort of thing. So a dog can be interested in something or even be nervous about something, but that's, it's not quite the same thing as just completely losing your cool. And all right, that's it. Everything, you know, everything is game over and I'm just going to go for this one objective. Right. Totally, 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 totally. Um, you said a word that I really like the word grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, and for people who use this word or know what it means, uh, would you mind explaining that a little bit? Yeah. So grounded or this, or, you know, or directed focused a dog, a really high energy dog. I think of like Malinois, border collies, shepherds, dogs that are really uppity and highly trainable, but they're also antsy and they have these, these kind of, you know, these classic classic issues, I guess that, you know, to, to put a word to it that people tend to struggle with. And the problem is it's not necessarily a matter of trying to take this, this really high energy dog and lower that energy or lessen it. Right. You know, we like that they're high energy. It's just when you put it to something that's functional and serves the dog and serves the owner, Mm -hmm. then things get a little better. So, you know, a dog left to their own devices can, I I think of like a dog with separation anxiety, just sitting there freaking out, not knowing what to do, chewing on things, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there are ways to ground them and direct them here. How about, you know, go do this particular thing. And you do that with limits and, you know, all the, all the other kind of buzzwords we're talking about start to kind of tumble in. I'm limiting dogs in order to take away options that aren't good for them. I've, I've known dogs that chew on something they shouldn't swallow it and go to the vet. (laughs) Right. Uh, You know, (laughs) I've had a client whose dog broke the window to try to get outside and follow the car. You know, it's, yeah. So those yeah. are limits. If you tell the dog, no, a crate in a, in a sense is the limit, but ultimately you're creating a safer space for the dog mentally and physically. Right. With right. that, with obedience, they understand what they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. They can manage their arousal via something safer, like a Kong toy or, you know, we're just learning how to place and relax period. Right. And just developing that, that skill as a muscle, you know, exactly. You know, it's just kind of like a live, a live wire that you plug into something. It's, you know, the right. energy can be there, but just make sure that it's going in a direction that's conducive and that's helpful. Right. Right. And, and I want to, I think you bring up a good point and I think uh, this is something worth talking about right now. Um, the difference between stimulating the mind and grounding the mind. Yeah. Right. And I hear this a lot with people who are really trying to get their dog um, under control. And, and, you know, you guys work really, really hard. And I actually enjoy clients like this because I'm actually able to tell them the work that you're doing is too much. And if you just focused on certain avenues of what I'm guiding you through, you won't have to work so much. So uh, let me explain this theory, right? A lot of people think, especially young working dogs, uh, German Shirt Pointers, Malinois, as you mentioned before, um, People think that there's this battery of energy that dogs have, right? And your agenda, they they think that your agenda should be every day, drain that battery to as close to zero as you possibly can in fear of that. If you don't drain that battery, that leftover energy is going to roll over into the next day. Right. Right. And so they feel like, oh man, my dog just chewed up the whole couch. And I think it was because I forgot to walk him this morning. Right. And, or they'll say, oh, my dog's acting out today because I forgot to hike him yesterday. Right. And the, the, the funny thing is when I asked them, I said, why do you do all this stuff? They're like, well, because I have to keep his brain stimulated. I got to give him something to do, you know? And so when I asked them about the walks, I said, so, so how are the walks? Like, tell me about how you guys go about your walks. They're like, well, we go for like an hour and a half, two hours. And you know, what's crazy. Like he's tired at the end of the walk, but then 20 minutes later, he's like back to normal Mm -hmm. and he's in, he's, he's still stimulated. Right. Um, and to kind of go back to, to those positive feedback loops, right. Sniffing and roaming, all that stuff actually amplifies our dogs and, and mm-hmm. you guys may not know it. So the reason why a working dog, like a German short pointer can walk for an hour and a half and track things is because guess what? That's what they were bred to do. 
right? And if we don't ground that dog into focusing on something like healing or paying attention or calming themselves down, then unfortunately what ends up happening, the dog actually gets overstimulated, right? And can be so stimulated. And so um, a lot of times people will also say like, you know, I need to stimulate my dog's brain because this is what their dog trainer has recommended for them to do. So they go, you know what? My dog um, is really aggressive uh, towards other dogs. And they said, I need to stimulate his brain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign him up for agility. Right. Right. And we all know what happens at agility class when that happens. Right. Um, the, the dog accidentally might go after a dog at agility class. Right. Because what's happening is this idea that the brain, that there's kind of this scarcity, like there's not enough stimulation that this dog is getting. Right. And the reality of it is, is the difference between stimulating your dog and grounding your dog is the difference between, you know, signing your kid up for, you know, 10 after school programs because he's ADHD um, or teaching your kid, you know, uh, emotional and meditative practices to be able to calm his nerves, relax, do things like that. Right. And so these are, this is, the, don't get me wrong, stimulating your dog is very important. Playing with your dog, walking your dog, exercising your dog is very important. But what we see is we see that it happens excessively and the grounding of our dogs. Um, which involve the development of structure and discipline and obedience and rules, right? That is ultimately what gets our dogs to chill and calm down and be the loving family member that we want. Yeah, I want to be super clear. It's not an either or scenario. If you have a dog that's very energetic, yes, exercise them. It's yes, it's very good for them, but it's not a substitute for grounding, for structure, mental right. structure. And so- right. What ends up happening, I just dealt with this the other day, twice actually in one day is same scenario, really high energy dog. It was a border collie coonhound mix, super high energy dog. Mm -hmm. And they walk him and he's, you know, same thing. He's really sweet. He's this and that, but he lunges and he, you know, he's going after every cat he sees, goes after every dog behind a fence that tries to bark at him. He doesn't like people coming over to the house. Definitely had some issues. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, well, we tried to walk him like two miles twice a day. You know, the mom currently isn't working, so they have the time and they're, right. they're really pouring it in. And I, I try to explain to them, it's good that you do that. And I'm, I'm really proud of you for being such a devoted owner. And I'd love to see it. Right. But while you don't necessarily need to stop, it's not going to fix your problem. Right. All you're doing when you take a dog with these sorts of, you know, kind of quirks to their personality and walk them for that long is you're taking this dog and still keeping his issues and making them worse and giving the dog excellent cardio with which to continue to do these things. <laughs> then the two miles turn to three miles, turn to four miles. Yeah, you know, it, you <laughs> know the old adage of like, I got a baby tiger and every time he growled at me, I fed him and pretty soon he was giant and now he's growling at me. So, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, I like that. You know, so, so it's, that's essentially what ends up happening. So yes, yeah. exercise your dog. It's, it's very vital, but it's not a substitute for structure. And I just wanted to clarify right. one quick thing. Yeah. When you talk about the ADHD kid, mm -hmm. The you say like putting him into you know a sport versus meditation, either one of those is grounding. So right. it, it's I look at it more as like the kid who can't stop you know hitting other kids. Right. You can, you know, you can put him to a sport and and think that maybe he's just overly energetic and stuff like that. And maybe that is some of it. But at the end of the day, no matter how exercised the kid is. Mm -hmm. You still have to teach them there is no hitting. Right, right, right. No, that's 100%. I agree with that. Um, so ultimately, what we really want to break down to everybody is that structure is intended to affect the dog's physical behavior, the dog's mental states, and the dog's emotional states, right? And this is ultimately why dog trainers are such huge advocates of structure because I want you guys to think about confidence. I want you to think about safety and security. And I want you to put yourself in, in, in a memory of someone who makes you feel so safe, so secure, who you trust, who you feel so confident about. And I want you guys to really think about that relationship and really just hone into that. And I want you guys to think, why do I love this person? Why do I respect this person? Why does this person make me feel so safe? And I guarantee you it has something to do with the way that the relationship is structured. Okay. Usually people who are inconsistent, we lose trust in. Usually people who 
um, you know, are all over the place. We don't necessarily rely on them for too many things. But the people that you guys love dearly and respect dearly, I want you guys to think about the structure that was in place and our dog trainer's goal for trying to guide you guys through structure or suggesting structure as a solution for things is just because we want your dogs to feel safe, secure, love you and respect you all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the purpose for this. And there's byproducts to safety, security, a dog that feels safe, feels secure is calm and flexible Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, and reasonable. So there's definitely, definitely things that, you know, they're, they're kind of like structure overall, you actively right. work this, but you're really going for this and the byproduct of it, which is that. Right. And what ends up happening, you start creating an environment where the dog feels emotionally balanced. Right. And mentally balanced. Right. And that's ultimately like, we're all trying to find that in our personal lives. Right. Um, and we can totally do it with our dogs. Um, awesome. I, I really like this podcast. I hope that this podcast was helpful for you guys. Uh, I hope it gave you some insight into the into what dog trainers really mean when we say structure. And for those of you dog trainers who um, who you know were having difficulty explaining this or describing this to your clients, please take read the, listen to this podcast again. We hope it was helpful for you um, because this is years and years of just interpret interpreting and breaking down and dissecting you know, things that, you know, I would try and explain structure to a client and then I would fall short and be like, damn it, how Mm -hmm. can I explain that better? How can, how can we teach that better? And that with the help of my mentors and, and the research that I've done, this is what it comes down to. This is what we've funneled it down to all mean. Um, awesome, man. Anything else you want to say? No, I mean, you know, you're hit, you're describing it perfectly. You can kind of tell for any dog trainers listening to this, if you have a hard time describing structure, I know, you know, the feeling of, you know, you're in the ballpark, you're like saying words that are close-ish to what you're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's frustrating when you just know you, and even sometimes it may still go well and you may still get your point across and they may still want to work with you, which is great. Mm -hmm. But you kind of leave and you're like, damn, why couldn't I, why couldn't I think of this word to really clearly help get my point across and that's why it's important to you know listen to this a couple times uh we urge you guys often to write it out and just and just write it out for your own sake you know not necessarily to give to anyone but sometimes in writing things out you think of it in a different way and then you reread it you know and just and hone it it's your craft right and i will suggest the best way to really understand structure is related to your life and related to a human experience. If you notice through this podcast, me and Mariana, we all have anecdotes that relate to structure from our own personal lives. And I think that's one of the best ways for you to connect with a human being, um, telling them a true story, telling them something about structure and how it affected you and how maybe it might relate to their dog's behavior. Um, that's ultimately what, what, what I feel is, is going to really hit, you know, hit the nail right on the head when teaching. 100%. All right. Awesome, guys. Well, we want to thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Dog Trainers Podcast. Again, this whole podcast was on uh, the idea of developing structure with our dogs. Uh, My name is Brent Labrada, and that is Mariano Alvarez. We're going to go ahead and put our Instagram handles and our emails down here. If you guys are interested in sending us in some questions, please feel free to do so. We're super excited to see what kind of things are on your guys' mind. Uh, We'd love to make that the next subject in our next episode of our podcast. Uh, We hope you guys have a wonderful rest of wonderful rest of your day. You're speaking dog. (laughs) Have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a wonderful rest of your day. (laughs) Hope you guys have a (laughs) wonderful shaggy. Um, we hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, please, if you guys found that this podcast was useful for you, share it with someone who you think might be able to benefit from it. Um, and thank you guys so much. We'll see you guys later. You guys have a great rest of the day. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen